All right, people. Review of the week time. So, we get to talking about the weekend's fights. Obviously, the main talking point, the main point of content is going to be Lomachenko versus Devin Haney and the aftermath that will soon follow from that. Have no doubt we're going to be talking about that plenty. But let's just start with the card that happened here in Ireland over the last 24 hours. Katie Taylor obviously taking an L against Chantel Cameron. I only seen I only seen the last three fights on this card. So I saw Dennis Hogan versus JJ Metcalf. Um gun to my head going into this fight, my money would have been slightly on Metcalf. Although Metcalf hasn't had the easiest career, certainly that loss against Ted Cheeseman, which was a great fight. It was about two years ago now, but that was a great fight, but really really he took a beating a bit in that fight did uh jj metcalf the stoppage well it was back and forth but it was a really tough fight that was on the pavekin white two card and then he lost a very close decision not long after that to kieran conway and it kind of seemed like he was in the wilderness at that point but goes get to win against kermit leharaga got that about this time last year over in spain has gone from strength to strength and he beat Dennis Hogan fair and square. I felt that the zone commentary team was not great. Well, I mean, they're never great, to be honest with you. I mean, they're awful. They're the worst in boxing. But they were exceptionally terrible at this whole card. They really were. So, Metcalf Hogan, it was a good fight, but JJ Metcalf was the fresher guy. He seemed the stronger of the two. I know he's been campaigning at that weight for pretty much his whole career. I know Dennis Hogan has gone to 160 pounds now and again, ventured into that weight, but it's not really his weight. And JJ Metcalf picks up an IBO title. Look, it is a lightly regarded title, it has to be said. I certainly won't be claiming JJ Metcalf for Dennis Hogan are world champions, but it's a title for them to have on their mantle. Nonetheless, it could put him in contention for potentially a crack at some of these titles when eventually Charlo moves up or the winner of Charlo Zoo maybe moves up and vacates. So... You never know. Gary Cully versus Jose Felix. I mean, that was the real... That was the fight of the night, really, because... Gary Cully is someone who I've watched over the years. At the start of his career, when he was on a lot of Queensbury shows and MTK shows, I really wasn't impressed. You know, he just came across as this big, tall, lanky 135-pounder, which you don't see many of them. You don't see many that big. You don't see many that rangy. And... There was a lot of flaws there from a technical point of view. You know, Cully was definitely a slapper back then. He really didn't have that much technique in his punches. He wasn't getting as many stoppages. I mean, if you look at him over his last couple of years, he's been getting guys out of there early and devastating. But when you look at him early on in his career, he wasn't really putting much of a dent in these guys. He was really going through the motions, just slapping his way to points decisions. So I didn't think much of him. Bit of work goes in. Starts looking a bit better, you know, beating the guys he's supposed to be beating and in good fashion like Miguel uh, Vasquez. You know, obviously he has been in there and arguably beaten Lewis Ritson and O'Hara Davis who fought there a couple of months ago. And Gary Cuddy took care of him in a couple of rounds. And actually, the fight after that, Miguel Vasquez got robbed again. So it obviously showed how much Vasquez still had left in the tank. Cuddy dispatched to him, no problem. So I thought he was kind of riding the quest of a wave. He was talking about world titles next year, making all the right statements. Then he goes into this fight. Now, from the outside looking in, and I guess you could probably say with hindsight, he probably put too much pressure on himself given the fact that he was back in Ireland, given the fact that he was the co-main event and the card this was on. And I wonder if that got to him a bit. Technically, he made mistakes in there, but I wonder if he was just too eager to impress. If he was just too eager to impress, just wanted to go in, wanted to make a statement, made mistakes, got caught in the third round, never really recovered. And the referee did a very bad job with the stoppage, I have to say. He really did. It was not a good stoppage. You know, Gary Cully, after the second knockdown, he threw a couple of shots and then he got hit with a left hook. And the way he fell back, the ropes kept him up. He would have been well in his right to call a knockdown there. And maybe then wave it off. But no, he let Cuddy take the shots. He let Cuddy take the abuse. And what happens? Well, we know what happens. He took unnecessary shots at the end. He was eventually stopped. But that's going to be a difficult defeat to come back from. Because Felix Diaz, you know, he's lost his last two fights uh, prior to this. Sandor Martin last year. He's been in the ring over a year as well. So it's not like you were dealing with someone who was fresh, who was active, who was fight, 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 fight. He's been in the ring a year, over a year. Lost to Sandor Martin, lost to Tyrone McKenna, lost to Pitbull Cruz. Who else has he lost to? 
Jonathan Martiello. He rings his name rings a bell, but I can't quite remember where I've seen him. But you know, guys who Brian Vasquez, I know who Brian Vasquez is. These are guys who are a level above well Tyron McKenna I wouldn't even put him a level above uh, Gary Cully but considering the fact that he was able to get through this fight it's not a good look so it's going to be interesting to see how he bounces back or where he goes from there in terms of the main event Chantel Cameron beat Katie Taylor I didn't watch the main event I only watched a couple of you know clips of it uh, but from what I was seeing it looked like Chantel Cameron was in control and the main talking point was why was this fight scoring a majority decision and why was this fight as close as it was on the scorecards well we know why i mean they could have if they could have they would have robbed chantel cameron they would have i said it from the start when this fight was announced i favored chantel cameron to win i did worry because this fight was going to be in dublin that every time katie taylor even landed on the gloves the crowd would erupt and by the looks of things that's exactly what they did but thankfully the right person got the decision and Chantel Cameron moves on to bigger and better things. There is apparently a rematch clause in place, so Katie Taylor could invoke that. Will they do it in Dublin again? Personally, I hope they do it in the UK because in the build-up, like this is just for me from the outside looking, people were asking me why I didn't want to attend this this fight and why I didn't want to attend Media Week this week, even though because it's so close to me, I normally have to travel over to Manchester or London to go to this. And the simple answer is, is that... When I go to these boxing events, I love being around boxing people. One thing I love about going to the press conferences for Matchroom, Frank Warren, etc. shows is that you're around these boxing people. Some of them know me from the channel. You know, I obviously don't know them. A lot of them I wouldn't know off by name because obviously it's a subscriber. I don't see their faces, but very polite, very friendly with me. You have a chat about boxing. It's just the atmosphere with them is very nice. I knew as soon as this fight was going to be on, you would have these, yeah, buddy. I cover that GAA, but um, I'm over from Fibsborough to cover Katie Taylor. I want to have an interview with Mr. Horn, you know, up the bows. Yeah, those clowns. You really think I want to be around those types of people? Hell no, I don't. Yeah, and they were out in force, it seemed, for this. And some people could say that's a bit hard. It's not really. I mean, you try living with them. They're not... <laughs> No, I couldn't. I couldn't. Uh, I like being around boxing people, not just these, you know, guys who come out of the woodwork when we have a one big event and then you never hear from them again. Not really my style uh, at all. So that was the main reason why I didn't want to attend any of these events or any of these fights because it just, I just would, I just wouldn't enjoy it. I just knew that I wouldn't enjoy it if there's fights coming up again in the UK, London, Manchester, Newcastle, Bournemouth, etc. Yeah, I'd happily go. I'd like to see. I've never been south, further south than London, so I'd like to go around Bournemouth, Southampton, Winchester kind of area and scope it out, actually, more so. Actually, that's why I'm, one reason why I hope Bill and Smith has some more dates now and there because I quite like to scope the south of the UK out because potentially that could be a uh, an idea moving forward in the next year or so to set up shop. Who knows? But in terms of the card that was on in Las Vegas, Nevada. The main point of contention, the main talking point, Vasil Lomachenko versus Devin. Hey, before we get to it, let's talk about the undercard, right? We, we, we'll, we'll sell the, the you-know-what out of this, but let's talk about the undercard. Nico Ali Walsh had a draw. Obviously, he's the grandson of Muhammad Ali. He drew with a guy who was 13 and 9. Um, yeah, not a great look, you know. Obviously, it's not a loss, but sometimes a draw can be as damaging as a loss when it's against this level of opposition. Danny Rosenberger, he's been stopped four times. Oh, no, sorry, he's been stopped once in those nine losses. Uh, feel Good Hollywood is his alias. Great alias, really, really great. Has lost the guys two and three. Uh, Mikey Delham, never heard of him. No, rings no bells. Kenneth Ball Jr., yeah, losing the guys with not great records and Nico Ali Walsh, who look, he's obviously going to be easy to promote. He is still quite young, but I've not been very impressed with him since he's turned over. And again, it's the it's the namesake, obviously. Like he's Muhammad Ali's grandson, but talent wise, it's just not there. Uh, Victor, or yeah, Oscar Valdez. I was gonna say Victor Ortiz there. Got a win again over Adam Lopez. That was a rematch of their fight back in 2019. The main fight that we really want to talk about on top of the main event is obviously Yanuto Nakatani versus Andrew Maloney. It was a flawless performance throughout. 
and he had Maloney down in the 11th. Nakatani was doing what he wanted to do. He was beating up Andrew Maloney. And then in the 12th round, with about 20 seconds to go, a brilliant, massive, perfectly timed right hand lands on Andrew Maloney. Gone. Uh, just gone. That right there may very well be this year's knockout of the year. It's going to be hard pressed to top that because it's just the way Nakatani was able to walk Maloney onto it, the accuracy, just the precision of it. Boy, was that a bad knockout. You know, Nakatani is a very impressive fighter. This is a 115 pounder. You don't tend to see many knockouts like that down at 115 pounds. Right, but Nakatani was able to do it. He is a big puncher. He's got a very good record. He's got a puncher's record, it has to be said. So I'm very excited to see how he come, how he gets on at 115 pounds. You know, if there's obviously fights there, if he decides to move up to bantamweight, which I wouldn't say is, is exactly gonna be too far in the future, Nakatani's gonna be a problem. It's a, you'd love to just I know Inoue is 122 and Nakatani's 115, they're they're miles apart realistically in weight, but Imagine those two at 115 when Inoue was fighting at 115 back six years ago. Those two going at it. That would be some fight. Oh, boy, that would be some fight. And obviously, main event, Devin Haney, Vasily Lomachenko. All right, Haney, Lomachenko. I talked about it in the post-fight review, and my thoughts are still the same, having watched the fight again in the cold light of day. Devin Haney, I have no issue with him winning this fight at all. I did not see a robbery in there, you know, a robbery, when you see a robbery in boxing, right, a close contentious fight can go one way or the other, or you can have a draw, right, that's how a close contentious fight can go, and this was exactly that, a close contentious fight, competitive the whole way through, Lomachenko, I thought nicked it, but I have no issue with Haney getting the decision, and people start saying robbery, okay, they're implying that Lomachenko was completely hard done by that he won this fight hands down. You couldn't make a case for Devin Haney winning. Well, you could make a case for Devin Haney winning. You know, there was a lot of rounds in there that were open to interpretation. There was a lot of rounds because the commentary team... And the commentary team, you see the way... Commentators who are focusing so much on one fighter, they can change the perception of how the fight is going. A good example would be... right. I've long since said, when I watched Alexander Povetkin versus Michael Hunter, the first fight... Or the only fight... The first time I watched it was live, and at the time I felt Pavekin won, because the commentary team were very pro Pavekin. They were picking up a lot on what Pavekin was doing in there, as opposed to what Hunter was doing. When you go back and subsequently watch it in the cold light of day, you actually see, oh, hang on a minute, no, 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 no. Hunter was doing things, a lot of good things in there, and then you come to a different realization, right? Because the perception can be swayed by how the commentators are doing it, and I think that might have been what happened with a lot of the people who were looking on. My interpretation of a robbery is Josh Taylor, Jack Cattrall, all right, is Manny Pacquiao, Tim Bradley won, is Derek Chisora versus Robert Hellenius, is Jamie McDonald versus Laborio Solis. Those are the types of fights that I would interpret to be a robbery where one guy clearly has won this fight. There is not even a debate. You can't even look and say he was competitive. It's a clear case of this is the guy who won and then somehow inexplicably the other guy gets the decision, and in some cases, they get it wired. McDonald versus Laborio Solis is a prime example, where Jane McDonald got barred from pillar to post for 12 rounds, and one judge gave it to him, I think, something like 9-3. Madness. That right there is a robbery. And you'll often see judges try their damnedest to do it. You know, Joe Smith Jr., when he fought, oh, I can't remember who he fought, um, Jesse Hart. Well, that was a split decision. I don't know how it was, how it was a split decision. Joe Smith Jr. clearly won it, trying to rob... Alexander Usyk against Anthony Joshua. They will try and do it, but thankfully they don't succeed. In this fight, no robbery I saw. I saw a very close fight. I just prefer some of the stuff Lomachenko was doing, but I have no issue whatsoever with the judges giving that fight to Devin Haney. Absolutely none. It could have went either way. It really could have. If you gave it a draw, that's fine. If you had Haney winning by a couple of rounds, that's fine. If you had Loma winning by a couple of rounds, likewise. I don't really see an issue with that at all. Right, one of the big talking points, and it needs to be brought up, is the fact that Dave Moretti scored the tenth round in favor of Devin Haney. That right there is just shocking, right? And it needs to be called out, right? Because when judges are this quote unquote incompetent, how are they going to be able to get away with that? How? Why are we letting them get away with that? 
you know apparently Dave Moretti was the gobshite judge who scored the round where Tank Davis dropped Ryan Garcia 10-10 I mean, so if this guy has a history of calling rounds, or scoring rounds, I should say, bizarrely, surely he should be brought up by the commission and say, why have you done this? Why exactly have you done this? Or interviewed in the ring. The judges should be in the ring and say, hang on a minute, why did you score it like this? What reason can you give? What rationale can you give? Instead of saying, oh, well, you know, talk to my superior. No, 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 no. Explain to me what you saw in the 10th round. That 99.9% of the world's population who are watching that 10th round didn't see. Because I'd love to know. You know, that's what we need to do. I think it will help it in a certain way. Don't know how much, but I think it will. In terms of what happens next for both guys, personally for me, I'd love to see Devin stick around at 135. I didn't think he looked that bad on the scales this time. And if he can make it safely, Shakur or Lon Marie match, I'm off for either of those fighters. Obviously, Bob Aaron was trying to get Devin Haney to stay with him because he's obviously talking about Lomachenko, Tiafima. He's on the top, sorry, Josh Taylor, Tiafima Lopez winner at 140. So we'll see. Speaking of signings that Bob Aaron has made, George Cambosis has signed a multi fight deal with Bob Aaron in top rank. He'll be working with him alongside Lou DiBella and Cambosis' own promotional company, Ferocious Promotions. So. Cambos is now sticking around uh, with Bob Arum, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Ryan Garcia, obviously we know Ryan Garcia after splitting from Goosen in the immediate aftermath of his fight with Tank Davis, has now hooked up with Derek James. That might actually work pretty well for young Ryan Garcia because Derek James... When he left Eddie Reynoso, I did scratch my head a bit, right? Because I was kind of thinking, especially when he went to Joe Goosen, because I was thinking, Goosen is a trainer who really does, he's more an aggressive trainer. He teaches his fighters how to be aggressive. He likes them to go in there, throw punches, be aggressive, go for stoppages, etc. Ryan Garcia, that's not his problem. Being aggressive, you know, attacking, all that. That's not a problem for Ryan Garcia. The biggest problem for Garcia is his defense or lack thereof and basic fundamentals. That's what he needs. He doesn't need a, a trainer who's going to teach him what he already knows. He needs the fundamentals to be taught to him. Derek James, I think, can do that. I hope Derek James can do it. The only thing there is, it says here, he will train alongside Spence, Charlo and Joshua. That's a lot. That's an awful lot. Now, hopefully with Ryan Garcia, he's kind of just going to be training with him for a couple of months. And then his next fight will be whenever in the spring or in the spring. It will be in the autumn or late winter. Because with all the fights coming up for his fighters, potentially, he's going to make he's going to want to have a lot of work on his own. He's going to want to make sure he's the, prior, he's the prime focus for his specific fight. So Tyson Fury now. Now we get on to this. So... Tyson Fury last week just decided for whatever reason to start making videos having a go at Alexander Rusek, his manager, Alex Krasuk, even Bob Arum to an extent saying to Frank Warren he wants to get him a fight in the summer and then having a go with Joe Rogan and I did say in a video I did about Fury, I think it was, it was Wednesday or Thursday, when he made that video mentioning Joe Rogan that was purely to get John Bones Jones to bite and react to it and he did indeed he obviously said that you know Tyson Fury in a boxing ring whatever whatever but in the octagon there's no touching me he also went Tyson Fury then on to have a go at Alexander Usyk's manager Alexander Krasuk he actually ruled out fighting Usyk in Saudi Arabia believe it or not despite the fact that the rumored purses that people like Simon Jordan have been talking about are astronomical like potentially as much as 90 to 100 million apparently he's ruling that out saying that it can only happen in the uk 70 30 split take it or leave it and he spelt wembley wrong by the way as well when bally he's obviously spending too much time with isaac lowe because isaac lowe if you've ever seen him try and tweet i mean it's just the spelling is just it's humorous you'd say isaac spell your name i z a k right and low ha 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 easy one it's on my trunks l-o-w and you're forgetting the e no that's isaac low he's probably spending too much time with him 
But to see what he said here, he pointed to Alec Krasuk saying this is a itch. We'll just swap a word there, swap a letter there, I should say. About you and the rabbit are itches. Come get your 30%. As from today, the fight only happens in the UK at Wembley. Take it or leave it. Something. <laughs> and, you know, this is a guy, right, who made all these offers to Alexander Rusek. 70-30, and if you don't take it, the purse decreases every day. Alexander Rusek takes it. He then moves the goalpost again. Now there's talk of the fight happening in Saudi Arabia. And he's already saying, I'm making these outraged demands, saying, 70-30, fight me in Wembley, or else... It this guy does not want to fight Alexander Rusek, for whatever reason. Right? For whatever reason. Right? I'm sure if the Saudis did offer the 90 to 100 million, which is the reported number, again, re reported, it could be less, could be more, probably less, but you don't know. He probably would. But to fight him in his backyard, right? He wants everything on his side. He does not want to fight Alexander Usyk unless everything's on his side. And even if Usyk agrees to it. And the weirdest thing is, right, you have these bizarre Fury fanboys. Right, and Fury is really not helping himself from a PR point of view. He's really taking a shade out of Conor Ben's book for how to do bad PR. And yet these Fury fanboys still give him a pass. You know, no matter what he comes out with Alexander Rusek, no matter how much he tries to price himself out or move the goalpost, they just accept it. But yet they still call him the man of the people, the guy who'd fight for free when he's constantly moving the goalpost, when he's constantly looking for more money and making these outrageous demands. And they contradict themselves. But they turn around and they say, oh, well, he deserves all this money. But I thought he doesn't care about money. Yeah, he doesn't care about money, but he deserves it and he should get paid. But isn't he the man of the people who fight for free? Oh, yeah, he would. So shouldn't he fight Usyk for free if it's such an easy fight? Oh, no, he should. Seriously, these people are just... Your mind boggles. It really does. He also said to Bob Arum, I want uh, you to get me that fight I'm due or give me my contract back. Now... When he says that fight, I'm due. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but as far as I was aware, the Dylan White fight was not the last fight on his top rank contract. So top rank had Fury for one last fight. Dylan White fight would be officially kind of a, a more Queensbury promotion, as was the obviously fight with Derek Chisora. I was aware that he had one more fight left on his ESPN top rank contract. Now. Maybe a stipulation in that contract is it has to be in the States or top rank have to do the bulk of the promotion. I don't know. But obviously with the fact that Tyson Fury cannot get into the States, given his association with El Chapahan. And again, just speaking on that and again, how stupid some of these Fury, because they are stupid. When all that stuff came out about Tyson Fury not being able to get in the States because of El Chapahan, and people like me and Hatman were reporting on it. You literally had people, right, commenting and saying, well, he's in America now. You, he's in America now. Fake news. When he's clear, like he's training in his gym in Rotherham. And you have these absolute imbeciles commenting and saying, what, lies, he's in. It's like they don't even know what's going on half the time. But I wonder if that has something to do with him saying the fight is due. And obviously Bob Arum wanting to get that fight in the States or have the big... He's, if he's not going to re-sign Fury or Fury is going to go his own way, whatever, he's obviously going to want to make a lot of money in the last fight. So he's obviously not going to want to promote, you know, Fury versus, let's say, Zhang, which won't make as much money. Definitely not as much as Fury versus Usyk. You know, so could be a bit of trouble there with Fury and Bob Arum. Let's wait and see. At the end of the day, I've said it once, I'll say it again. Get undisputed over the line. That's all I want. Whatever happens after that, I'm all good, as long as we get undisputed. And, you know, Joe Stunner said this, and I agree, it, it's getting old now. And I think, you know, a lot of the fans have seen through it now. And at this stage now, I think the best thing is to just ignore it. Like, obviously I'm talking about it here, but after that, like, it's a real case of waking up when we get there. Because it's just getting boring now. It really is. Just, the only thing is, though, the videos still do good views, which is kind of like a catch-22. They do really, really good views, but at the same time, it is getting boring. What can you do? Anyway, moving on. David Hay, that this is interesting, has joined Chris Eubank Jr.'s team as an assistant coach ahead of his Liam Smith rematch on July the 1st. Uh, Eubank's trainer will still be Roy Jones, but he'll have David Hay in there as well. That's an interesting one to me, because, like, David Hay... I don't think he's ever done anything in the realm of boxing training or anything. And him being in Team Eubank's team, um, I know him and Eubank are good friends. And maybe it's about getting Eubank, 
You see, here's the thing, and I said this long ago. Eubank needs a trainer who's really going to, maybe it's too late now, but back in 2020 it mightn't have been, who's going to basically deconstruct them and try and rebuild them as a better fighter. And there are good trainers out there who can do it, but Eubank's problem is that he doesn't respect these guys. You know, Adam Boot, when he was training Eubank Jr., I think he said Eubank was untrainable or worse to that effect. And Adam Boot, with that version of Eubank, you think it would have thrived. You would have thrived with um, Adam Boot because Adam Boot loves those type of fighters. He does like them to be a bit more, how would I say, kind of ambushy. You know, keep it behind the jab and launch in. But fighter with that kind of athleticism, Adam Boot loves that. He loves those type of fighters. But Eubank just, no, won't listen. Roy Jones... Roy Jones is a trainer, the jury is still out, like, he's not really done anything, but because it's Roy Jones, Eubank is listening, and maybe because it's David Hay, Eubank will listen, where in reality, you know, you would need, with Eubank Jr., I mean, against someone like Liam Smith, offense is his best form of defense, it really is, so, I really don't know, and Dave, David Hay is never the most offensive fighter, you know, certainly at heavyweight, he definitely wasn't, you know, he waited for an opportunity to counter punch, you know, a little bit more offensive at cruiserweight, but again, he set that all up behind the jab. And with Eubank, you saw in the Liam Smith fight when he started just going up close, letting the uppercuts go, he had the most success. So, I don't know, it's an interesting one. They overturned the Joe Fournier versus KSI fight to a no contest. The PBA, I've never heard of them, are they would they be because I thought I saw Ian John Lewis ringside doing the judging for that fight so i wonder is that the kind of one of the like there you know these fights that happen in the uk they're kind of pro fights but they're not really they go they're not really white collar either they don't go on an official record but they're kind of a pro fight if you know them whereas like a lower down sanctioned body you know they're not recognized by any of the governing bodies they're not recognized by box rec i wonder is it one of them because i know they've done cards in the uk in the past where fighters have fought on them they've been quote unquote pro fights i mean i think they've got paid for them they've sold tickets etc but they've not got anything in terms of you know rankings or you know if you look at box rec and you type in we'll just say ksi if it's not being a licensed pro fight with the boxing board of control it's not on his record i wonder if it's one of them but they've overturned it to a no contest rightfully so it was clearly an elbow but we'll see what happens with ksi next now Conor McGregor, obviously, was at these Katie Taylor events in the build-up to the week. And he declared that he wants to come back to boxing to fight Canelo Alvarez, of all people. He says, I'm a southpaw. John Ryder's a southpaw. Billy Joe Saunders is a southpaw. I've seen methods. I've seen things I do. And I know he's waning. I'd fight Canelo. No effing problems. Yeah, John Ryder is a southpaw, as is Billy Joe Saunders. And Canelo beat the living crap out of both of them. And, well, Conor McGregor, he ain't no John Ryder, he ain't no Billy Joe Saunders, and he ain't looked good even in the octagon over the last few years. And judging by the actual way he was looking at the Katie Taylor event, I mean, the old how you doing is really showing. Because he looked old. Old, old. And God knows what he's like when he gets back in the octagon. I can't imagine him doing much. Now, this was interesting, and people were asking me for my thoughts on this, and... I really don't know what to make of it. Um, so, Andy Ruiz was claiming that his Twitter account got hacked because there was two videos that were uploaded. Well, there was four altogether, but there was a re there was two specific ones. One, he was holding two big bags of the old green stuff, which, you know, Andy Ruiz, that doesn't exactly surprise me, to be honest with you, that he'd be smoking away on that. You know, I, I would imagine Andy Ruiz out of camp or even in camp, well, probably out of camp, is the kind of guy who would play a bit of Call of Duty, smoke away, and eat KFC all night. That he kind of strikes me as that type of guy, so that doesn't surprise me. The one that really was surprised me was him connected to the drip and making claims that that was how he was basically able to come clean when Vada were tested him. Now, the drip is used in boxing. I remember interviewing Spike O'Sullivan several years ago, four years ago I think it was, where he said that David Lemieux in the build-up to their fight on the KL Triple G2 undercard was using the drip to rehydrate because he rehydrated something like 25 pounds overnight. So it's known that that happens 
when you're talking about fighters trying to rehydrate, they're rehydrating intravenously with the drip. But Andy Ruiz being a heavyweight doesn't need to do that. So that is a strange one. He obviously claimed, as you would, that he was hacked. Um, he claims that was by his ex, who definitely is not in the good books. Well, Andy Ruiz definitely isn't in her good books. But he has a lot to answer for, for those questions. Like, for those videos. He definitely does. I mean, the old green stuff. I mean, at the end of the day, like, I... I wouldn't really be too bothered about that, to be honest with you. Andy Ruiz strikes me as the kind of guy who would smoke away all the time anyway. But it's the it's the drip. That's the real one. That's the real one they got to be asking questions over. They really do. Now, David Benavidez's promoter, Samson Lewaski, has declared that they will be sending Canelo Alvarez an offer next week, so this coming week, for a fight in September, following meetings with Eddie Reynoso alongside Luis de Cubas who works closely with Al Heyman. So potentially, lads, again, potentially, I've heard Team Alvarez say that the priority is the Dimitri Bivol rematch, and that's what we're waiting to see happen. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't be saying no to Benavidez versus Canelo. It's definitely a bigger money fight, I think, because they're going to be doing that on, what, Cinco de Mayo weekend, September, middle of September. That is going to be pff, electric. Now, I've seen this. Kel Brook and Conor Ben having a bit of a heated moment at the Katie Taylor Chantel Cameron show last night. And I'm not going to lie, it looked, it just looked cringe. It literally just looked. They couldn't have staged that any better if they tried, right? And Conor Ben, again, no one in the PR team telling them, he says, if you choose to fight me, it's your death wish. Oh, men, keep calling me out. I think you should stay retired, but I'll beat them easy and cash in lovely so they'll want it they can get it i ain't gonna turn down fights to fight legends why don't instead of looking to go and fight retired fighters like kel brook and manny pacquiao what's wrong with saying you know i'd like to fight the winner of terence crawford versus errol spence or if terence crawford and errol spence can't get it on i'd like to step in there or maybe i'm gonna watch the winner of stanny Ones versus um victor ortiz was it steady owners or was it someone else actually he's fighting but anyway i'd like to maybe fight victor ortiz or someone like that you know he's all these old retired fighters he's mentioned and happy out but yet when you talk about boots ennis and people like that and you know some people could turn around and, and they're right you know, they could say well you know boots ennis doesn't have the deepest resume but at least boots ennis wants to fight errol spence he's mentioning errol spence's name when have you ever heard Conor? Uh, I was going to say Conor McGregor. But have you ever heard Conor Ben mention a top welterweight? You haven't. Oh, but he's mentioning Kell Brook. Kell Brook retired by the time February next year comes around. Two years. Manny Pacquiao's been at, at retired for what little, just under two years now. Anyway, you know he's naming all these old guys. And what does he actually think that the public are that stupid? Maybe he does because he's not the sharpest tool in the box himself. He's pretty dumb. Conor Ben is really an NPC when you think about it. The way he just doesn't seem to get anything. He's also stated that he's hoping that the UCAD investigation into his positive test will be concluded by the end of June. I reckon they're going to do a backdated ban on that. They'll probably give him a backdated ban and that'll be the end of that. Probably backdated by a year, 18 months, give or take, there or thereabouts, and that'll be that. So that is pretty much the news in a nutshell. I don't want this video to go on well over the half hour mark. I'll leave it there. I hope you enjoyed the video. Smash the like button if you could. Hit subscribe, of course, if you haven't already. We'll do a live this evening around 7, half 7, depending on what time I get home. But we'll do a live nonetheless. For now, lads and lassies, I'll leave you there. Smash the like button if you could. Hit subscribe if you haven't already. I hope you all have a great week. Peace.